Great. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's um, SEJ Marketing Think Tank webinar. This is Lauren Baker, uh, the founder of Search Engine Journal. And uh, with me today, I'm very excited to have Stoney DeGeiter, the president and CEO of Pole Position Marketing. Um, but before uh, Stoney gets started and I have a chance to, well, say hi, Stoney, to everyone. Hi. How's everybody doing? I know you can't answer me, but hi. <laughs> I'm excited about this webinar for two reasons. Uh, one, because Stoney, I'm pretty sure I've been reading your stuff for the past decade, and this is one of the first times, well, besides uh, getting ready for this webinar, that we've had the chance to chance to chat, um, besides a casual handshake or hello at a conference. And two, because your company is named after my favorite video game ever as a child, Pole Position. So welcome to the SEJ Marketing Think Tank, Stoney. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate it. <laughs> so today's webinar is going to be um, on 18 ways to build a mobile site users love. So we're really going to dive into mobile usability um, and everything else. It's very, uh, you know, very present information given the recent Google updates, the fact that uh, most uh, searches are, are done via uh, mobile devices than uh, desktop. And also with uh, scrambling uh, by companies to make sure they're they're getting them the, uh, their users the most mobile friendliest ever. But before we get started, I just want to do some um, <clears throat> uh, housekeeping. So um, just to let everyone know, our official hashtag is hashtag SEJ Think Tank. Um, during the webinar, if you have questions for Stony, there is a question box at uh, on your GoToWebinar control panel. So you'll be able to type questions into there or uh, feel free to hit Stony up. I think his uh, Twitter handle is on his slides or using hashtag SEJ Think Tank. Uh, we're going to have two polls uh, during the webinar. At those time, uh, we're going to ask you some questions and, and you can uh, just give a multiple choice answer. That gives us some feedback on the webinar and also some nice stats to share with everyone that's attending the SEJ Marketing Think Tank. And at the end of Stoney's presentation, we'll be uh, doing a full on Q&A. So get your questions in. And um, on that note, I will hand it off to you, Stoney. All right. Thanks, Lauren. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, hopefully we'll uh, educate you guys a little bit on um, how to uh, build a mobile site that people really love and of course search engines too is that's important to what we're all doing here with web marketing. Um, so let me just introduce myself a little bit. This is me, obviously. Um, I do web presence optimization. Um, that's what I like to call search engine optimization, but in the real world, we're not just optimizing for search engines, we're optimizing for an entire web presence, which covers everything from social to content and uh, whatever else there needs to be. Um, you can follow me here, uh, Twitter, Google+, and LinkedIn. And there's my company. <clears throat> and um, if you are interested, you can check out my book on Amazon, the best damn web marketing checklist.com. Uh, go to webmarketingchecklist.com and you'll get all the information there. Uh, this presentation was pulled um, pretty much from the book, at least one section of the book on mobile marketing. Um, at least part of the presentation was uh, just to give you an idea of uh, you know all the all the value that that book has, um, and this is just a, a snippet of it here, but let's jump into, you know, why mobile-friendly design is important. And I think over the past few months, we've heard a lot of talk about Google's um, algorithm change for mobile, and we'll address that um, coming up here, but let's just kind of hit on why this is important to begin with. Um, first of all, what we've seen over the last few years is that mobile internet usage has surpassed uh, using the desktop. And if you look at this chart here, that blue line is actually mobile apps. Um, the bottom purple line is uh, mobile browsers. And so a lot of people are using the internet on their mobile device but through an app. Now that's not to say that mobile search isn't important because a lot of people now are doing searches through apps. Google has apps for searching. I often use Google Maps to search for phone numbers of local places and things like that. So it's not just um, the browser activity that we're um, thinking about here or, or that we find important. It's just that all internet usage on the mobile device now is more than what people are going and sitting down in front of a computer and using. 
And in fact, more searches are now performed on mobile devices in 10 countries, uh, including US and Japan, which means when it comes to search, more people are doing that somewhere other than in front of a computer. They're taking their iPad, they're taking their iPhone, and they're doing searches, whether it be from the apps that we talked about, or they're going to a browser and doing a search, or using Siri, or OK Google. Um, so what we've got here then is just this important aspect that more and more things are happening on mobile devices, more than we've ever seen before. Uh, also, we've got this new multi-screen experience, and uh, I don't know how many of you, you're watching TV and you see, hey, you know, pick up the second screen, and they want you to tap into additional details and notes and things like that of whatever TV show or movie that you're watching, and do that on your mobile device. So a lot of people are, quote unquote, multitasking while they're watching TV, watching movies, whether that means they're multitasking about what they're watching, um, or if you're like me, I'm often on IMDB looking up actors and um, facts about the movie that I'm actually watching right there. Um, in usually movies I've seen before because I don't like being distracted. But um, we see this more and more common where people are doing using multiple devices all at one time just to immerse themselves in whatever it is that they're doing. So what we found is now that mobile-friendly design is absolutely critical and primarily here for local search. Um, not just critical for, I mean, it is critical for all searches everywhere, but when people are searching local, more and more of those searches are done from the mobile device. And nearly half of US mobile users use their mobile devices for product searches. Um, and, and this is important because if you want to be found, especially if you're in a, a specific geographical location and you want people to find you, you want people to find your products, you have to have that mobile-friendly site. 80% um, of local searches performed on mobile devices actually do convert to a purchase, which that's a, a pretty big deal where having such a high conversion rate where people on the mobile devices seem much more ready to hit that buy now button than maybe if they're at a desktop or they're uh, you know they're doing some research where they go to the phone and they say hey I'm ready to buy this I'm going to do that and you, of course you have to have that mobile friendly design in order to make that happen and what we do find is mobile unit users are also very finicky if they do find you uh, they do get very they do get frustrated very easy which means they are more likely to walk away, they're more likely to go back and do another search if they're not having a good experience on their website. And this is especially true if they land on a site that doesn't cater to the mobile device at all. It just becomes almost impossible to use. So you want to make sure that when people are finding you, when they're doing searches on mobile, that they're not turning around and leaving again because of that bad experience. Um, and then, of course, we have MobileGeddon. And we've all heard of this. We thought it was going to be a really big deal. Uh, MobileGeddon was going to change uh, drastically the search results. And, of course, it wasn't, wasn't up to all the hype. Um, but there is still a algorithm out there geared specifically for mobile. And we do have to pay attention to that. Basically, it comes down to this. Mobile is not the future. It's now. We are absolutely right now living in a mobile age, and we can't look at mobile and say, hey, you know, well, that's the future, and I'm going to get to that. We have to look and say, it's now. It, it's past. The time has come that if you have not already started, at least started on the path of making your website mobile friendly, you are behind the curve, and you are losing uh, people. You're losing audience right now as we speak. All right, so we'll go ahead and go into the first poll question here. Absolutely. Thanks, Sony. So I'm going yep. to load up the poll right now. <clears throat> the first question for the SCJ Marketing Think Tank poll for today is, were you impacted by mobile getting? Um, so if everyone can please take the time to fill out the answers. Uh, selection number one being, I died in mobile getting, and all I got was this lousy website. Or mobile getting was a huge wake-up call for me. I think I felt a few tremors, then fell back to sleep, and it was business as usual. So we've had about 50% of the SEJ marketing think tank uh, vote already. Uh, we're at 65, so I'll give everyone a chance to kind of get in in the next, um, let's say, five seconds. 
Okay, 66, 67, 70 percent. It's kind of just like American Idol here. Um, so uh, let's see. We're at 72. Let's give it one more chance. All right, we're gonna close the poll. So we had 74 percent of the think tank uh, vote. Pretty interesting. Um, it looks like 65 uh, percent of you said it was business as usual, not much really changed, right? With 21% saying there was a huge wake-up call, which really goes back to what you were saying earlier, Stoney, where as the future is now and or it's already passed, right? Mobile is now. So very cool stuff. Okay. Well, that, that is interesting that uh, most of you thought just business as usual, and I am going to address that later on uh, towards the end here. Um, but for those of you who, hey, this was a wake-up call, and, and honestly, it really should be a wake-up call for those of us who aren't mobile-friendly because the algorithm will continue to adapt, continue to change, and, and be more important, and it will affect more and more websites. So what you need to do then is we have to really start building websites on a mobile foundation. And let's look at how to do that real quick. Uh, mobile can no longer be an afterthought. Uh, I think in the past, you know, when we do web development, we think, okay, we've got our web development, here's our design comps, and everything looks good, and oh, all right, now the site's done, let's go ahead and make it mobile friendly, or do something to make it work on a mobile device. And we really can't live in that world anymore where we have to start thinking about websites almost as mobile first. Um, because so many people are using mobile devices that we have to think of that may be the first point of contact that anybody has with your website is through a mobile device. And if you're not thinking mobile first, then basically you're saying, hey, I don't want half of that audience. Or they're not as important, and they are. Because we get, like we saw, there's, there's very high conversion rates and there's a very high engagement rate on mobile devices. So plugins and add-ons and, and you know those basically are just a band-aid solution and, and they can be great for a very short period of time. Uh, those of us who work with WordPress, there are plugins that you can put in and boom, your website is mobile friendly. Ta-da! Uh, they do an okay job, uh, but what we need to do is get past this area where we're just going okay, eh, mobile we can do that, but our main focus is the desktop where we have to think mobile is going to be a key uh, issue here for our visitors. So we have to make sure that we're building the website for mobile, whether it's more important than desktop or equally as important as desktop, it does need to be there on that same level at the very least. Uh, so basically that means looking at responsive designs, um, and that's one of the primary ways to make a website mobile friendly now. Um, basically, responsive designs conform to any screen size. Um, it's one, one, one website, and regardless of what device it is, it reacts differently for those. There's a couple different mobile friendly options, other mobile configurations such as dynamic serving, um, using separate URLs completely. They all have their drawbacks um, and can be difficult to implement. Google ultimately recommends a responsive design and not that we care all that much what Google thinks on the web design front because we're just designing websites and we're, we're doing this for our visitors not for Google um, but they have a point where you know when you do a responsive design you only have one site to maintain it's going to work on any platform any device it, you know do your troubleshooting and it does allow Google to call the site more efficiently because it's you, you've got the same URL throughout you're not doing multiple URLs or duplicate URLs or anything like that so um, from a web marketing perspective I also definitely recommend responsive design there may be cases where you want to use something different than that um, but I would think that they're pretty few and far between overall um, all right so let's get into some of these action tips and this is the, the information that is pulled pretty much from uh, uh, one of the chapters in my book best damn web marketing checklist um, but we're going to go through some of these action tips on how to build a mobile friendly website uh, number one we need to design buttons and links for fat fingers um, you know when you're on a mobile device you don't have a mouse 
Um, some mobile devices have styluses, but that's not all that common. Um, so what we've got for clicking devices is our fingers, and our fingers are not precise. They're very fat, and we often miss our target when we're trying to click around a mobile device. So you need to make sure you design with that in mind. You have to have plenty of space around each click clickable element. You need to make sure the buttons are big enough so you can click on without having to be too precise. Um, and you want to make sure you're not accidentally clicking something else. So keep that in mind that you know the, the clickers are our fingers and everybody has different size fingers and very unless you're a kid, you know, it's it's not going to be too precise there. <clears throat> Two, collapsible nav navigation. And this is important because your screen size on mobile is much more limited to, than it is on a desktop. In fact, over the years, we've seen desktop monitors get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's been great. Then all of a sudden, mobile came out and the screen size just shrunk. It went down to a minuscule size once again. And of course, those are getting bigger and bigger you know, sometimes to the point of ridiculousness, but, um, you know, you were still dealing with a very limited amount of space. So when it comes to the mobile device, you want to have your main navigation hidden um, where you have to click on the hamburger menu or something like that to where it'll open up the menu for us to use. Uh, this is very different from a desktop, where a desktop, you want your main offerings and main navigation to be right there for visitors so they don't have to click to see what they're doing. But with a mobile device, because we need the content to be front and center, uh, that makes the menu have to disappear. Basically, it has to move out of our way. And especially because we are now using menus that are designed for fat fingers, so they have to take up a lot more space. So the best thing there is to make it collapsible, make sure it gets out of the way, and the, the uh, user can get to it only when called upon. Number three, less text. Um, now, I don't believe in using different text for a mobile device than for desktop, but how that text is presented can make a, a big difference, especially for the mobile device. So what we want to do is we want to present less text immediately to the visitor, more white space, more openness, less denseness on the mobile device. So you want to look at that and go, you know, with the website, hey, you got you got your page there and you've got a lot of different information and it just doesn't work the same on mobile. Um, it just makes everything a little bit too cluttered. So you want to kind of reduce that back um, and put text behind, you know, where you have to scroll a little bit to get it or maybe put it behind, um, you know, some actions that you have to click on to actually uh, read some of that text. And it really depends on the website itself. But overall, you want to think about how do we simplify what we're doing on the mobile device. That doesn't mean take away all the content, but it means simplifying it for the mobile user. Uh, chunking content, and um, you know, I just kind of alluded to that, where you hide content behind a, a menu or a clickable link, and we see this a lot, um, and, and more people are doing this on desktop, uh, where they'll present some content content and then you have to click a button to read more. Um, that's to not push products out of the way or things like that. Uh, mobile devices, this is very important. You want to chunk your content. Wikipedia does a really great job of this. If you look at a Wikipedia website versus a, um, their desktop site versus their mobile site, um, you can see how they take all of that content that they have on a page and they just reduce it down into headlines and chunked areas where you can scroll through all of those headlines and then click and open one at a time and read the area, read the information that you want for that particular area. So that's how we need to think about mobile devices. You can use the exact same content, but you need to organize it in a way where people look at those headlines and they say, yeah, that's the information I want and make it easy to skip the rest of the stuff there. Large readable fonts, um, because mobile devices are so small, those fonts tend to shrink down and become almost unreadable, which means people have to sit there with their device and, and try and expand it a little bit. Um, and, you know, iPhone on some websites has a reading view that allows you to get rid of all the clutter, but why force people into using that option when you can design that into your website, make your content readable. Use a larger font, use more font spacing, um, line spacing, things like that. Whatever you can do, make sure you're looking at it and go, is this readable? 
comfortably. Is this comfortably readable to the average user? And just design around that. Don't think of how much content you can get on there. Think of how you can best present your content in a readable way. Uh, number, number six, when you're doing forms, and I've got a, a few slides here specifically dedicated to forms because this is important on mobile devices, um, again, due to that, that limited space, put your text label above the entry field. Um, when, it's, when it's side by side, um, if that's a force thing, then either people have to turn their phone sideways or they might have to scroll side to side just to read what's this field for and then go in and put the answer. So the easy way to solve that is just put the, the field above the entry so people can read, click on where they're going to input information and go ahead and do that. Um, you want to remove placeholder text from form fields. Um, and this is a, a great example where in this form, all of the fields have the text that tell you what it is. Well, there's your first name, there's your last name, and of course you look down below company name, as soon as you input text, you lose what were they asking for here. And that becomes a problem where people are filling out the form, they click on it, and then they get distracted for a second, like, whoa, what was I doing? What was the information here? And they either have to click off of it or they have to remove their information to try and remember what all they're looking for. So the best thing to do is, going back to number six, put the you know, text above the field. Um, don't put placeholder text in the form fields at all. All right, we're ready for poll question number two. All right, excellent, Stoney. Let me get this. Are you there? Up. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, all right. So poll question number two is, how mobile ready is your website? <clears throat> Select one of the following. Pretty self-explanatory here. Everyone can take the chance to vote on how mobile friendly your website is. And um, hopefully no one falls within the mobile what category. <laughs> um, if so, I uh, suppose definitely after uh, Stoney's webinar today, it'll be a little bit higher up. So, oh, wow, we've had 70%. So, oh. 80% of the think tank vote thus far. Stoney, I think we're going to have to use polls like this more often. So um, <laughs> give everybody a couple seconds. We're at 81% have voted. Pretty interesting numbers here. And um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. And let's look at the results. So 100%, 30%. Uh, I'm all over this. Another 30% almost there. Well on my way, and I just started at 18 and 16% respectively. And 7% of the think tank, 0% <laughs> from a mobile friendliness perspective. So um, this is going to be a very educational, uh, there, this has been a very educational um, uh, webinar for, I'd say, the bottom half here. So that, that's fantastic. Go ahead and hide the results now. And we'll be sending these out after the webinar along with a, a recap that ever, everyone can um, – Get some more information on um, uh, Stoney's tips and also view this on YouTube. So back to you, Stoney. All right, thanks. Well, it's good to hear uh, so many of you are pretty much all over this and, and doing 100% here. And, of course, as things change, algorithms change, there's always going to be more to do, um, at least keep an eye on for being mobile friendly. Um, so let's move on. Number eight here, um, use selection boxes. And again, going back to f using forms, if there's an option for people where you can pre-load uh, it with selections, do that. Don't make people type on the mobile device when they don't have to. Now, of course, we're all accustomed to typing and texting on the phone. But again, we're, your job is to make things easy for your visitor. And there's nothing easier than scrolling and selecting something rather than having to type something in um, from scratch. Uh, eliminate pop-ups. And th these are getting better, people using pop-ups on mobile devices. I'm still not a fan. And the reason is, is the more I see the pop-ups being used, um, I just keep finding those, whatever sites that I'm on, they're impossible to close. The pop-up somehow overhangs the screen. I'm turning my phone sideways. I'm trying to move things over and get to that X to close it out, and it's just not working the way it's supposed to. Um, you don't have to completely eliminate pop-ups. I mean, again, this is one of those things that you know they're valuable. Um, they have a purpose. I would say avoid them altogether if you can, uh, but if you do use them, absolutely, absolutely make sure that they are easy to close 
on the mobile device. Um, very, very easy. Otherwise, you're just going to frustrate your visitors, and you don't want to do that. Uh, number 10, on-demand social sharing. And again, this goes back to hiding content and navigation under you know, uh, clickable links to call up that action. You want to do the same thing with social sharing. Um, I mean, you, it can look okay to have your social icons there, and maybe if they're big enough, the people can click on them just fine. That's okay. Um, but by and large, you want to push those off to the side because there's just usually too many options and it's just space clutter. So if you can hide all your social icons under a single link that says share this, boom, that opens up the options and then they can select the option they want. That's going to be far better from your users um, and for the visual experience on your site or each of your pages. Uh, Mobile is also a great way, place to utilize uh, horizontal scrolling. And uh, we see this a lot um, coming into desktop. Uh, I know Google uh, toyed around with that um, with the carousel. Um, Netflix is a great example of that where they show you uh, a lot of options and you can scroll sideways and then you can scroll up and down. And if you have anything that works in this format, um, use it because mobile devices is a perfect place where swiping to the side for scrolling that way for chunks of content, not the entire page. Um, you don't want people to have to scroll and move the entire page over, but for chunks of content on the page, swiping is a great way to present much more information in a very small amount of space than you otherwise would be able to do. Um, optimize images. Uh, mobile displays images, you know, obviously smaller than desktop because you're looking at a very small device, and usually when sites are developed, a lot of times they develop it for the desktop. Here's the image size that fits perfectly, um, but then the mobile device has to shrink that down. And when you're doing that, one, the mobile device has to load the entire large image, even though they're not showing it in that large size. Um, and what that does, that increases your load time. And then it has to shrink it. The browser has to shrink it down. So ultimately what you want to do is optimize the image not only to uh, fit the screen size, as much as you possibly can. But you also want to optimize the image for speed. You want to reduce the, uh, the byte size of the image, of, of every image on your website so it's as compressed as possible so it loads as quickly as possible. Because again, we don't want our mobile users to sit there and try and load a larger image for a bigger screen um, where they're just sitting there waiting for that image to load where you can do some things to compress that and make it display much faster on the mobile device. Uh, you want to reduce your HTTP requests and ultimately this comes back to talking to your developer and say, hey, what can we do to reduce the number of requests going to the server because every one of those requests increases the load time. And so this is all about making your site move faster, um, about combining um, style sheets, combining CSS, um, and doing whatever tricks that you can to eliminate the number of those requests going back. So again, your site can start moving and be lightning fast rather than kind of this roadblock of, hey, all these requests are being done at once. That's slowing everything down. So the idea here is to speed things up as, as fast as possible. Reduce uh, scripts and inline styles. Um, CSS, JavaScript, whether it's on the page or you're using external style sheets and, and JavaScript files, you want to reduce a number of those files in total if you can. Um, and again, this reduces the number of HTTP requests when you do this. So you want to combine those as much as you can so there's fewer calls going to the server. Um, bring all of that information into uh, fewer documents. Uh, again, because you want that one document to load, to load fast, and then that be the only reference that the site needs to use going forward when it's pulling that information in. And, uh, you know, use CSS instead of uh, JavaScript. JavaScript is a bit slower than CSS. Um, and CSS, HTML5, they offer a wide range of solutions that have replaced, you know, a lot of functions of JavaScript, a lot of functions of Flash, um, and animations, things like that, and it's much cleaner, um, and the, the code bloat is significantly reduced, making the site much faster overall. Um, you want to tie your address to GPS coordinates. Um, obviously, uh, Google and things, they're very good at finding your location based on an address, things like that, but you never know um, if they're, they're going to be using something that's not going to be
be able to pull that address from the website and and find it. Um, in fact, I have uh, when when I moved in um, to the place where I live now, we had a very hard time pulling up our address on Google Maps. Um, we were in a very weird location where we were told it was uh, a Lake Township, but it was actually Union Town. Some of the bills came to Lake Township, some of them came to Union Town, some of them came to Green Town. So there was this, we're right in this weird location where three different areas converge. And nobody quite knew where we were, including Google. In fact, when we Googled our address, it gave us a location at the far end of the other side of the city that we live in. So it was just really weird. So things like that can happen where Google may not know where you are or some of the other devices or apps may not be able to find. But if you can tie that on your website to your GPS location, then you'll make that um, just basically a sure thing for people to be able to find you. Um, offer a link to the full website. Uh, there's one thing I hate, you know, if there's any one thing that I really hate when working on mobile uh, mobile websites is <clears throat> you often lose some of that full website experience and this isn't always the case but sometimes you're on a mobile site and functionality that you know is on the desktop just isn't there and I want to go to that desktop site I want to be able to click a button and go there and if you're using a responsive design you don't have that luxury um, unless you're going to follow a link and it's specifically going to tell the the mobile device to serve that desktop. So you want to have that option for people. Um, I often just feel like I'm missing something from the mobile device. I'm missing whether it's a functionality or something that I'm trying to get to or even if it's just how I'm comfortable using a particular site. Um, offering that link to the desktop just makes it more comfortable for the people who are already familiar with you. Um, so that pretty much wraps up all of the tips. Now, remember, we talked about mobile Geddon, and for most of us, it didn't have a whole lot of impact. But you know, one way to look at mobile Geddon is it's it's going to be more of a delayed impact. Um, it Google rolled out the algorithm now, but as they do with all algorithms, they change. They start doing more things. They start looking at more things. So. You know, if you didn't have a chance to get your website prepared for Mobile Geddon, you still have time, and it will basically be a work in progress. But at some point in time, if you haven't done it yet, you're going to have to realize that Mobile Geddon is coming for you. It is going to be a factor for your website, and it is going to make an impact, even for those of us who snooze through it when it rolled out the first time. There, it's going to come a time where we're not going to be able to snooze through it anymore. It's going to, it's going to be important. So. Get your site in order now. Start looking at making it mobile friendly. Uh, go through all of these tips, and I'm sure you can find a whole lot more. Uh, Google offers a lot of tools for site speed and things like that. So keep tweaking your site. Keep looking for ways to improve. And really, that's what we do with online marketing is we look for ways to improve our online marketing presence and the experience that people have on our website. So don't just look at the desktop experience. Make sure you're looking at the mobile experience as well. So that's it for me. And again, um, you can get all of these tips um, plus a whole you know, 600 more at webmarketingchecklist.com. Great. Great. Thanks so much, Tony. That was a lot of information. Um, in about a half hour's worth of time. So, and uh, just to remind everyone, um, after uh, today's uh, SEJ Think Tank webinar, we're going to be publishing uh, the recording of this webinar on YouTube and uh, emailing everyone uh, with that link and also an update on the SEJ blog, as well as more or less a, a transcription of most of this on the SEJ blog in the future. So, um, but in the meantime, uh, in the same fashion that we had a highly engaged uh, Q and A, or I'm sorry, poll session, we have a lot of questions for you, Stony. So cool. uh, I'm going to get these together, read them to you. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to uh, tell you one thing that really resonated with me was when you talked about um, no one really knowing where exactly you live. I live in the town of Valencia, which is in the incorporated city of Santa Clarita which is in LA County. So what happens is I, uh, the, the gas company told me that I did not live in Valencia. I live in Santa Clarita, right? Although all of my mail comes to Valencia. And, um, uh, then I had another, um, utility company that wanted to set me up with another town's information in a separate zip code than what I have. So this is 
kind of an issue. And I also see it, I see a difference when I'm, um, if for any reason I'm checking in on Foursquare or sometimes tweeting and using the, the geo mapping with my tweets, is that uh, even Twitter will pick up wrong towns or wrong locations, which I'm assuming is based upon like a mix of the um, my phone and, and, and the tower nearby, but it seldomly picks up the exact town that I'm in or live in, which is funny. Um, so let's get things started from a Q&A perspective. Uh, question number one, um, how can small businesses with not a lot of resources make their website optimized for mobile? Um, I, kn I know you said plugins were a Band-Aid solution, uh, but anything else for a smaller uh, business, mom and pop shop, whatnot, to make sure that they're uh, optimizing for mobile? Well, when all you've got, uh, I mean, when you're working on small budgets uh, and have limited resources, sometimes a Band-Aid is the best solution, and it's, it's better than nothing. I mean, it'll stop the bleeding. So I would start there, start with the plugins, um, and then just you know start chipping away at some of these things that I went over here one at a time. Um, whatever options that you have, whether you have to hire a developer or you need to um, just have somebody internally start working on some of these things, use the tools that are available. Um, Google Webmaster Tools will give you a lot of hints about what you can do to make your site more mobile friendly. Um, just start chipping away at those things one at a time, and eventually you'll you'll get there and you'll get it done. Great, thanks. So, um, second question is: uh, Google is telling us that there's not enough room for fat fingers on a few pages of our site. Uh, these problems are in the primary navigation. On other pages of the site, it says the exact section is okay. So it sounds like. Uh, Google is reporting that some pages don't uh, do not have enough room for the larger button icons or other icons, whereas some pages that are designed the same internally do. Any thoughts on that and why Google's picking that up, uh, giving those mixed signals? Uh, well, I mean, ultimately, I would just err on the side of caution. If they say it's okay in one, but saying it's not on another. I would use the warning to see what you can do to fix it, to get it okay on all. Um, when you're dealing with machines, I mean, nothing is absolutely precise. They're going to be looking at a range of different things, and something, it just might be right on that edge where it might trigger it or it might not. Uh, but I would definitely look at that and say, all right, this is something we need to fix. Go ahead and fix it, and then we don't have to worry about the warning. Great. And you had touched upon this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to ask this question. Um, does responsive design mean that all site content should move, uh, should also be accessible within the smaller mobile browser? Or can um, the site owner pick and choose what is served? And uh, what's the best way to do so to make sure the most um, important content is served to the mobile user upon the uh, first scroll? Well, Google has said that when they are ranking mo uh, websites on mobile devices, they use the content from the desktop. So technically, you can serve entirely different content on a mobile device, and it'll uh, be pulling the, desk the content from the desktop site. But I don't recommend that because, again, everything changes, and there will come a point where I'm sure Google will start looking at the content on mobile devices, or they'll penalize if they see it significantly different between the two. So what I would do then is just look for ways to present the content, keep the same content, just find better ways to present it on the mobile device. Um, and again, it goes to chunking the content, um, and just you got to be creative, you know. And we've been dealing this with desktop sites for years, where people say, "No, I don't want content on there. I just want people to see my product." And we say, "Well, you know, the content sells the product." So you have to find solutions where we can put content on the website without destroying how the website looks, feels, or is used. And that mobile's no different. Um, we just have a different amount of space to work with. You know, it's actually interesting too because, <clears throat> like, uh, we recently designed a, a, a new site for a client, and 65% of their organic traffic is from mobile. So instead of taking the hey, they're in the education space and they do a lot of radio and TV, right? So people hear information, branded information, and they search. But point being is that that really was a case where we went mobile first. 
with the design. Mm-hmm. And desktop is kind of their, it, it's, desktop makes sense, it's still a large percentage of their traffic, but we almost kind of went in the opposite direction. How should this work on mobile first? And then how do we take mobile, the mobile experience and how it propagates in the content on mobile and make sure that that's available desktop as well. So it was almost looking at things, (laughs) almost looking at things entirely differently than Google does. Right. Yeah. And, And I would start now looking at, you know, when it comes to content development is looking at it from the mobile device first and say, what is the content for the mobile user? What does it need to be? And then using that over on the desktop. Um, And again, I don't think that necessarily means you have to have different content. I don't think that means you have to throw everything out and start over, or they have to say, well, we definitely have to have fewer words on the page. Uh, You know, to me, the number of words on the page is the number of words you need for that page to succeed, whatever that is. It could be 50, it could be 500, it could be 5,000. So, and the same is for mobile and desktop there, but think of the mobile user first, organize your content for that, and then apply those organizational principles over to the desktop as well. Fantastic. Here's a question, a set of questions from Dawn. Um, Some of the questions have names, some don't. Um, And one of the uh, askers' names was Kay Money, and I didn't want to uh, have us laugh while uh, saying her name. But um, Dawn asked, uh, when you're reducing an image size, would you uh, suggest um, a JPEG image? And then also, specifically, how do you reduce the uh, number of um, HTTPS uh, requests? Yeah, this is beyond my pay grade. Um, I'm not a developer, and these are the type of questions that I bring to my developers and say, hey, these are the things we need done. Do it. Um, and you know a lot of web marketing is that way where we don't necessarily know how something is to be done um, we just know what the end result needs to be and if you take uh, is you're managing web marketing you take that stance say you know what I don't even care how it's done I just know what the end result is I'll give it to you I'll let you figure out the details so unfortunately I can't answer that because that is more of a development question and Lauren maybe you do know the answer to that um, and I just don't uh, I, I really don't. I try to compress or have someone compress images as much as possible, whether that ends up being a JPEG at the end of the day or, uh, or whatnot. Um, uh, usually go with a smaller image that still that still works. Um, we do have one more question from Dawn, and this is actually kind of interesting. Um, and I've struggled with this a lot. Do you advise mobile or desktop websites for the tablet user, being the tablet screens? can get fairly large and how do you um, differentiate a, yeah I think it's somewhere in between and again this goes back to using responsive design that it takes into account what screen size you have thereabouts um, and it adjusts the content and the display accordingly so it may not quite be exactly what you see on a phone uh, it may not quite be exactly what you see on the desktop. It might be somewhere in between. Whereas a mobile device or a phone, you might have the navigation completely hidden. Um, but on a tablet, you may not need to do that because you have more space. Um, and therefore, you can put that there. But then you might have it go away once you start scrolling, whereas that's not the case on um you know, uh, a desktop or what have you. So I think you just got to have your developers look at each device and look at, you know, the screen sizes and to have them react accordingly uh, based on however, you know, much room there is being viewed. Yeah, and that's really one of the benefits of Responsive too is that your, you know, screen sizes are, are changing dramatically. Like look at the iPhone 6 Plus, right? I mean, that's basically a, a mini tablet. So something that's set up for the smaller handheld device, right? The smaller mobile device may just not look good on the six plus. And who knows what the seven, how big the seven plus is going to be. Um, oh, please. I hope it's no bigger. <laughs> <laughs> at, at the same time, you know, one of the great things about responsive Two is that, um, you know, I, I'll see people tweet an M dot link a lot of the time. And then when I open that up on my desktop browser, it's still like a page specifically for, for the mobile, right? So um, 
sometimes those M dot links don't redirect or they're not, they're not properly set up. So even on the desktop, you're still seeing, um, uh, structure set up for M dot or mobile. Yeah. yeah. You definitely want to make sure it, um, especially when passing links that it, it registers for the device it's being viewed on. Here's a question specifically around about uh, slide number 16. Um, how do you tie addresses, your address, to GPS coordinates? Good question. And again, I would refer you back to the developers who do that type of thing for a living. Great. These, these are just uh, questions I don't know the answer to. Sorry. Uh, do you have any more best practices for contact forms on the mobile? Uh, besides not having them pre-filled or anything else that you can add? Um, for Specifically for mobile, um, that pretty much is what I have. Um, we do have a whole chapter of the book dedicated to forms. Um, so that can cover, that covers desktop, mobile, whatever. Um, so if you're looking specifically for mobile, that's pretty much all I have, but you can refer back to the, the full checklist there for uh, more information on forms. Fantastic. Um, I think that is um, most of... Uh, we have some image-specific questions here. Um, so uh, this is a little bit less technical. Uh, should the user have uh, multiple images in different sizes that are served for the desktop or mobile, or just serve up the larger image and then have that change um, for the mobile device, like have that image itself be responsive? Yeah, um, I, when the image itself is responsive, uh, the device has to load the full image, and that takes time. So it is always best to have multiple size images that are being called depending on the size of the screen being used. And that way, each of those images can be optimized for that screen, for resolution, and for speed. Great. And then also, um, Vahan would like to know, if we display different HTML structure for mobile and desktop by detecting device on the server side, this may be a little bit more of a tech question. Is there any chance that, that will harm SEO? So it sounds like the device is being detected by the server and then serving an entirely different H HTML structure or site structure. Um, I mean, I, I technically I don't think there's a huge problem with that from at least the search engine marketing side of things as long as the URL is the same. Um, but I do think it creates complications for uh, maintain, maintenance and upkeep of the website. Great. So um, that's uh, all of the questions for Q&A on our okay. side. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add, um, Stoney, for uh, the remaining attendees? Any, any, any kind of last-minute tips or anything like that? No, I mean, other than just keep plugging away at um, making sure your site works for the mobile users, and this requires using the site, getting on the mobile device, going through, doing actions, you know, clicking on things, and making sure it does exactly what you want it to do. Um, anything that you find while you're testing that you're frustrated with, you can be sure your visitors are going to be frustrated with. So um, just do a lot of mobile testing, you know. Um, we focus, we've always focused on uh you know, desktop testing, but now we have to go into the mobile devices and multiple mobile devices and test it on all of them. Or at least different screen sizes, not every device, but different screen sizes. Great, great. Well, thanks again, Stoney. And just uh, to let everyone know, um, the uh, YouTube recording or the video recording of uh, today's um, SEJ Think Tank webinar is going to be available on the SEJ YouTube channel and sent out to all registrants of um, today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank you again, Tony, and or I'm sorry, Stoney. <laughs> sorry about that. And the team at Pole Position Marketing for putting this together. Um, book looks amazing and everything else. And I just got an email earlier saying that we're going to be on a... a session together at PubCon. So looking forward to catching up with you a little oh, bit. Oh, fantastic. Um, but just to let everyone know also, um, our next SEJ Marketing Think Tank webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, August 5th. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. We're going to have Rocco Baldessari, who's going to be speaking on 15 methods for optimizing your Facebook ads. So um, 
check into that. And you'll definitely get an email in the future, and we'll be uh, publishing that information on the site. I'd like to thank you again, Stony, and for everyone uh, for attending. We'll be sending, like I said, we'll be sending out a recap soon. And uh, thanks again from the team at Search Engine Journal. Thank you.